All right, so there are three main uh, mechanisms that we have to regulate enzymatic activity. The first of these is a classification known as inhibition, and you're probably familiarized at least with some of this stuff already. Feedback inhibition is a good example uh, where the end product of a pathway will actually end up inhibiting the first step in that biosynthetic pathway. And the reason that this is really good is that this feedback inhibition enables us to reach some level of optimization uh, very organically. For more like fine-tuning type of methodologies, we have reversible inhibition. For shutting off an enzyme completely, we have irreversible inhibition. And then lastly, allosteric inhibition, which affects the KM and modifies the shape of that sigmoidal curve. Well, what most of this video is going to be about is about covalent modifications, or sometimes called post-translational modification. And then obviously in genetics, you learned about how transcription and translation uh, can control the amount of enzyme that's present in the cell. So the first of these, and really the most important, in my opinion at least, is phosphorylation. And the reason why I think phosphorylation is so important is, well, one, it's, it's extremely anionic, a phosphate molecule is. Um, and this anionic nature of phosphates induces a very, very strong conformational change in the enzyme. It's reversible, and so that's also pretty nice. In that. And you can link the enzymatic cascade that you're working with to the energy state of the cell. And so that's a really, again, a novel way that gives us optimization. Acetylation is more so for like uh, genetics. You'll learn about histone modifications and other things, uh, as with the RNA polymerase modifications that we have taking place. But lipid, attachment of lipid molecules is another great way of covalently modifying enzymatic activity. The only problem with that is that these are irreversible reactions. And so you'll notice that uh, SARC and ROS are not only because of the modifications that are happening to them, but because of the nature of the cascade that they're involved with, these can tend to be associated with certain types of cancers. Gamma carboxylation is also, we'll give an example actually of gamma carboxylation in, uh, in this video. Sulfonation and then ubiquination is a great way of getting your proteasome to just destroy the enzyme completely. Not mentioned in this video though was the role of uh, reactive oxygen species and how they can oxidate uh, disulfide groups or thiol groups to form disulfide bridges. These can induce very, very massive changes in the protein's conformation and are starting to show some evidence that they're being utilized for signaling cascades for growth factors and other things. Another example that really wasn't listed as a covalent modification per se is the protonation of histidine molecules. As you know, histidine has a pKa of about 6, give or take, and this pKa of about 6 enables it to be within range of certain unique microenvironments that can allow us to put a proton on a histidine. And depending on the context, that can induce a pretty big conformational change in the enzyme that you're working with. So what all of these have in common, specifically though, really the phosphorylation cascades, is the concept of amplification. And so if we were to just, let's say we graph this, this is our time axis, this is our signal axis. Let's say that we're working with a, a signal transduction pathway. Um, starts off really weak and then very quickly grows super, super fast. That's what amplification is. Very rapid and very, very loud signal being sent throughout the cell. Uh, one becomes 10, 10 becomes a 100, 100 becomes 1,000, so on and so forth. For intracellular enzymatic activity, we have a lot of advantages. We can put phosphate molecules on. We can take phosphate molecules off. We have compartmentalization um, and a bunch of relative consistency within the cell that enable us to have a bit more leeway in terms of what we want to do. But for the extracellular environment, much of what we have to work with is, is basically not there. It's, it's a chaotic uh, environment. It varies depending on the uh, specific cell type that you're working with. And so proteolytic cleavage is really to extracellular enzymatic regulation what phosphorylation is to intracellular enzymatic regulation. Most proteolytic cascade enzymes are synthesized initially as something called a zymogen. I don't really understand the word origin of the zyme part, but ogen means generators. So for example, the pre-enzyme or proenzyme pepsinogen is a pepsin generator. Chymotrypsinogen is a chymotrypsin generator, and so on and so forth. So they'll usually be synthesized in this form, and then after proteolytic cleavage, they'll become these active enzymes. It's not just enzymatic activity, but insulin as well, I think, is, is also adheres to this, uh, this strategy. Okay, so here's an illustration from the textbook of showing, in the case of the GI tract, trypsin, and all the downstream effects of this. So trypsin not only activates all these other enzymes, but it can also play a role in activating itself. Trypsin is the master regulator of a lot of these enzymes. So I want you to think about it. Given the fact that we don't have compartmentalization, and we don't have the consistencies that we have, let's say, with uh, intracellular environments, how do we regulate, how do we modify trypsin's activity in an extracellular context? 
Well, if you had guessed an inhibitor, you would have been right. And I'm not just talking about any type of inhibitor, I'm talking about serine protease inhibitors that have a negative 75 kilojoules per mole uh, gives free energy change upon binding. That is, that is more energetically favorable than the hydrolysis of ATP. These things can last, these enzyme inhibitor complexes can last for months on end. Very, 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 very strong inhibition happening. And this example that we give is the lysine here is going to obviously interact with this aspartate at the binding site, and that's going to induce a very, very strong uh, enzyme inhibitor complex. This is really, really important, though, because autodigestion is, is a pretty big problem in certain types of diseases and plays a role in a lot of pathologies. To give an example, people who, let's say, they have the, the uh, in this case, it's the antitrypsin, so if we were to go back here, we know that trypsin plays a role in the conversion of proelastase to elastase, and elastase is, plays a, lo a large role in maintaining connective tissue properties, but if you overactivate elastase, you're going to end up getting destruction of your connective tissue. And in people who either have a genetic defect where they're lacking that inhibitor, or they're smokers and they oxidize their inhibitor and it can't bind as well with that negative 75 kilojoules per mole uh, binding energy, elastase is going to remain in the active state longer than it should be and that's going to result in degradation of the tissue, in this case of the lungs, leading to emphysema. I, I don't know why this is a shock to you. Smoking is bad, kids. Another example that we have of extracellular proteolytic cleavage cascades leading to a rapid uh, response and, and signaling would be the clotting cascade. And I'm not really going to stress this stuff up here. Um, I actually made a concept maps for medical physiology if you'd like to know the details of this, but this is really more so uh, focused from a biochemist perspective. So they all, either the you know intrinsic pathway or the extrinsic pathway through enzymatic cascade, or in this case the, the glycoprotein tissue factor, they all converge on this final common pathway. And so this is not just useful in that this is something that they both converge on, but a lot of drugs work just by modifying the final common pathway. And since the first uh, proenzyme that we work with is prothrombin, I'm going to take some time just to little, illustrate a little bit about it. It has, in the prothrombin form, a GLA domain, and the GLA domain is important for calcium binding, which I'll illustrate that later. And then two crinkle domains, which are just structural domains that apparently look similar to a Danish, a Danish treat? I don't really know. It's like a donut, but not really. I'm an American. I don't really know. <laughs> I don't know much about that stuff. But yeah, so this is the first step in the pre-enzyme. And I, I want to also kind of illustrate a concept that not a lot of people understand. The pro-enzymes, they're not just created like that for the sake of regulation. They have functional domains in the pro-enzyme for example, with prothrombin. So this leads, this importance of that GLA domain is for calcium binding. The reason why calcium is really, really important, if you've ever worked with calcium, you know that it will form a precipitate with anything that is anionic very, very quickly. And in this context, we're exploiting that property of calcium. So by using calcium, we can localize the prothrombin to the site of injury, usually on the anionic surfaces of the platelet. One of the things that we can do is uh, to facilitate this binding and, and to make sure that calcium does not go around and do whatever, is to add a, a gamma carboxyl group to it. This is done through things of vitamin K, and this creates a molecule called a chelator. And a chelator is something that prevents an ion from just floating around and binding and doing other things. If you've ever worked in healthcare, you know about the uh, anticoagulant EDTA, EDTA is a calcium chelator, and it works by a similar mechanism, preventing the calcium from, in this case, interacting with the prothrombin, which prevents the clotting of your blood. Okay, so yes, vitamin K is essential for this. Uh, we actually call it vitamin K clotting in, in Swedish. I think in Swedish, yeah. Clotting is spelled with a K, so vitamin K is needed for clotting. I always thought that was really interesting. Um, understanding of that biosynthetic pathway has led to a lot of other developments of drugs. For example, warfarin or coumadin. This is also derived from rat poison as well. It's creepy how many drugs in uh, cardiology are originally once just really good poisons. We activate thrombin. Thrombin is going to act on converting fibrinogen into fibrin. So over here we see a picture on the structure of fibrinogen. Notice that it has three chains to it, an alpha, a beta, and a gamma. And on the beta and gamma globular units, there are some binding sites. Those binding sites are used once we have the proteolysis by thrombin to reveal s sequences where we can have some cross-linking taking place. And it's not illustrated in the book, but it's not just between the alpha chain and the gamma chain, but the beta head globular head unit can bind with the beta cleavage site as well. 
These tend to be rich in glycine and arginine, which would tell me to think that there may be some anionic amino acids taking place in these head groups, but the textbook didn't really mention it. Doesn't really matter. Once we form this interlocking, we have something called a soft clot. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna have transglutaminase come in, and this is going to catalyze the formation of a covalent bond that makes a very thick and dense fibrin mesh. Blood clotting must be regulated, obviously, precisely. You don't wanna have blood clots just randomly and spontaneously form within your blood. So they have to form rapidly one, in order for these activation cascades to succeed. And it has to remain localized to the area that you're working with, for obvious reasons. Activation factors are really short-lived. Um, the blood has a lot of, of kinetic energy within it, and so it's very easy to knock things out of place and induce confirmation. But they're also diluted by blood flow as well. Nearly all biochemical reactions are concentration dependent. They're also gonna be degraded, in this case, by proteases. That's pretty much the only thing that you can do uh, at least in this context, to, to dissociate that reaction. Thrombin is actually the, the master regulator of this cascade because thrombin not only plays a role in activating other factors in this uh, cascade, but also activates protein C, which ends up shutting off this pathway as well. And protein C has a lot of other biological functions as well. So antithrombin-3 is a specific serpent as well that plays a role in, in inhibiting these pathways. I think a lot of drugs work in, along a similar mechanism as that of antithrombin-3. And then this picture down here that I wanted to show was, is uh, talking about tissue plasminogen activator. And so what TPA does is after you form this clot and after everything's healed up, you want to break that down so that you can get a restoration happening here. But it's used clinically a lot um, in cases of MIs where patients, uh, let's say I think this is a patient that had initially had an MI and then I think about one or two hours afterwards they had administered TPA either through like a cath lab or through a central line. And you can actually see the improvement in the blood flow in the before and after.